podcast, David Kingsley, Senior Vice President and Chief People Officer at Velocity, talks about the future of HR leadership in the future of work. So stay tuned. Welcome everyone to Work to Auto podcast. Today we have with us a, a wonderful guest. So David Kingsley, a brief bio. So David um, is a senior vice president and chief people officer at Velocity, a Fortune Cloud 1000 company, future cloud 100 company, leading uh, industry cloud app adoption on Salesforce and driving digital transformation for the world's leading brands. Kingsley joined Velocity from MuleSoft where he served as head of global people and places prior to and through the company's acquisition by Salesforce. Previously, he held roles uh, of increasing responsibility at Salesforce, where he served as Senior Vice President of Human Resource for Strategy and Operations, as well as Vice President of HR Business Partners for Sales Technology and Products. Prior to Salesforce, Kingsley spent 13 years in talent and organization leadership capacity in the consulting division of Accenture and Booz Allen, serving clients in government and communications and high technology industries. He holds an MA in organizational science from George Washington University and a BA in organizational and a BA in international relations from Catholic University and is lieutenant uh, in the US Navy Reserve. With that, David, welcome to the podcast. Michelle, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Thanks for having me here. So, um, I'm glad. I think um, one of the fascinating thing about your background is um, the breadth and the depth. I think you have both in, in a very interesting way. So government, like you check all the boxes, enterprise, government, consulting, product, um, and high tech, low tech. It's, it's, it's. So why don't you walk us through your journey? Like what brought you to this point? Sure. Yeah. It's, well, it's, uh, it's interesting. It's a circuitous journey. And I think that I'm, I'm sure you'd agree um, you know, the, uh, the journey that we all have on our career paths is unique. And I think if you asked me 20 years ago where I would be today, I don't know, I probably would have given you an answer that sounded something like international relations working uh, in, in Brussels or something. Um, and instead, I'm talking to you in the, on the 50th floor of the Salesforce Tower in downtown San Francisco here at Velocity headquarters. And, um, and I am what I kind of characterize as an enterprise software person um, and really started out in management consulting um, in that space. Um, when I was in consulting, you know, I was on the line. I was serving clients and customers all around the world. And uh, I had an HR business partner who's, who shall remain nameless. Um, but this individual um, really failed to provide a level of, of so service and support to me. It always felt like when he was in the room with my team um, that it was a binder that he brought. And it was like his policy binder. It was tab three, you know, subsection four says the following and he would read and then we would have to go do that. And I actually, Vishal, one time uh, we were doing calibration with, with one of my teams and I, I stopped the meeting and I, uh, I excused him from the meeting out in the hallway. And I said, I'm going to ask you to actually step out. And his eyes got real big and I thought, oh my goodness, I'm making a real career limiting move here. Uh, but I said, I failed to expose you to the nature of what my team does in the marketplace and what we're mm -hmm. facing and the talent we're trying to attract and how we're trying to lead the team, et cetera. And I said, that's on me. I've just failed to connect with you on that and, and failed to give you awareness on that. So he and I met a couple of times over the next month or so and got him a little bit more um, informed about that. And then he rejoined my team meeting for the next calibration session. We're doing performance reviews and was much more equipped to contribute to the discussion. So uh, as I was reflecting on that in my professional journey, um, that was the point at which I said to myself, something has got to be done about the traditional way that we think about how we provision HR services. Mm -hmm. And that's a two-way street. It's first of all, the business, the clients coming to us and saying, we want you to be a partner at the table with us. And it's the HR teams around the world, or what we call employee success here at Velocity, the employee success teams around the world really showing up to that table and owning what they're working on and owning that journey and owning their role as contributing function in the organization. Um, so it's this continuum of, are you a necessary evil kind of over here on the continuum? Um, are you uh, a critical enabler, which is kind of here, like pick up the phone when I call you, or are you truly a trusted advisor? And to the point where when an executive says, wait a second, we've got to get Jane in the room. Before we start this conversation, I need my HR business partner or my, my compensation benefits person in the room for this discussion versus 
having HR be at the end of the line when it's like, hey, we need to do these things. Can you just go execute them? That is, I, I see that as kind of a failure on our part as HR leaders. More of when we're winning is when we're being invited into the room for the initial part of the discussion or the client is saying, I cannot have this meeting without my HR person here for it. That's when we've really achieved. And so starting my career you know, back in consulting, my first exposure to the HR discipline was really the kind of necessary evil. It's like, oh, I'll call my HR BP when I need him, but please don't reach out to me. Versus the goal that I have for, for my teams and for our organization is really around how are we serving as a trusted advisor as that partner uh, model. Interesting. And uh, before we go into this, I think fascinating background, by the way, and, and definitely I have some questions on that. Um, sure. Why don't you walk us through velocity? Like what is velocity? What do you guys do? Yeah, absolutely. So velocity is the fastest growing uh, company on the Salesforce app exchange. Um, to our knowledge, we're one of the fastest enterprise software companies, fastest growing enterprise software companies um, that we're aware of. Uh, and what we do is we take the world's most powerful customer relationship management software, which is Salesforce, and we're built on the Salesforce platform. And so we support and face industry verticals. So the room I'm sitting in right now is insurance. Next to me is health insurance. I've got government down the hall. I've got energy behind me. Um, so these are highly regulated industries. Um, that we serve and we configure and deliver on the Salesforce platform in a way that a customer buys a license of Salesforce software and they buy a license of Velocity software and that accelerates their journey to time to value and helps uh, that customer's customers connect with them uh, in new ways. And it brings companies and customers closer together. So that's just the nature of customer relationship management. Um, but we spent five years and you know over $100 million building this company that configures and, and, and creates the value for the customer right out of the box. So if you think about when you buy Salesforce license, and, and many of your um, readers and listeners probably have it in their organizations, really powerful tool. I've been using it for almost 15 years now uh, myself. Um, then Velocity comes along and we, we give them even more power on, the, on that platform to drive uh, time to value in the market. The reason we face those industry verticals, frankly, Vishal, if you remember the last time you called your, your mobile telephone provider, right? Mm -hmm. You probably didn't wake up in the morning and say, gosh, I can't wait to call Verizon or I can't wait to call Sprint. Um, it's because it was sort of a lackluster customer experience, right? Mm -hmm. They didn't know exactly who you were. They were trying to sell you stuff you didn't need. They didn't have all your history in front of them. And so where Velocity partners with our customers, it's in helping transform the nature of those customer relationships. Um, for those industry verticals. Um, so we're really proud of what we built. Um, we're about uh, 900 people globally around the world today, presence in 24 countries, um, and we'll grow probably next year to around 1,200, 1,300 people. So we're doing about 50% year-on-year um, headcount growth uh, in the organization. So uh, really kind of a uh, high rate of growth as a company, which brings into play all the things that your readers and listeners understand around how do you scale um, and, and drive a meaningful employee experience. Interesting. Wow. So uh, one thing I think um, I was fascinated um, by your response is that HR should be a partner to someone's success journey and not really meet at the end um, of the process. So very radical thought. I think the systems, somehow the, how HR is designed today, it's not designed that way. Mm -hmm. So and, and HR being sort of closely working very closely with the culture of the company, what is what has been some of your struggles in getting in getting sort of this um, futuristic HR installed, which is mm -hmm. not really typical HR that we we can relate with? Like what what are some of the challenges that you are seeing? We'll be back after a short break. This part of the podcast is sponsored by Tauded AI, world's first AI powered platform to build yeah. enterprise success network. Learn more at Dowdwood AI. Let's go back. Yeah, the great thing is I, I really believe, Vishal, that we have the building blocks of exactly what we need to create for our companies. The, the core constitutive elements are all there, and the professionals that we need in the industry, there certainly aren't enough of them. We always need more great HR talent around the world. Um, and at the same time, I think we've got the right players on the field, if you will, the right players on the pitch, depending on where you are in the world. Um, the way that we're thinking about it differently is taking a design thinking approach to the nature of HR. And so uh, I think of it like um, customers. So employee as customer. So if you think the last time you went into the Apple store, for example, um, you walked in the front doors of this you know, super large glass wall in the front of the, of the building. It's all white and shiny inside and you know, chrome and everything. And you walk in, there's a person in a colorful t-shirt there 
and he or she or they greeted you and said, um, welcome to Apple, what can I help you with today? And you said, oh, I'm here for a new case for my phone. Okay, fine. And they send you that part of the store. And when you get to that part of the store, there's another person in a colorful t-shirt who says, okay, what kind of phone do you have? What are you looking for? What are your needs? And then in about you know 10 minutes, you walk out of the store having spent anywhere from 50 to 500 or $1,000 um, and you got a huge smile on your face because it was a seamless transaction from being greeted to being presented with product options to getting your questions answered to the transaction of actually making a purchase decision, right? They're on that little handheld device. You tap to pay or you swipe your card or you put your chip in and then you walk out, they email your receipt uh, and you we don't have a bag. Maybe you just take the device out there or they give you this cool little bag you carry out. And it's a really seamless customer experience. So true is the same of our customers when they walk in the doors of our company because those customers are our employees. They walk in the door and they're expecting a customer experience, a customer grade experience for their employee experience in the organization. And so when we shift that mindset of employee as customer, I think that's the first part of what expectations do I have out in the marketplace of the vendors that I interact with as a customer, so too do our employees have those expectations. So that's where the start point is employee as customer. Mm -hmm. Then we think about that customer in segments. So just like great service providers and vendors around the world think of us as customer segments, um, so too should we in, in, in HR. And so the four segments that I, I like to think about are the candidate experience, the new hire experience, the employee experience, and the manager experience. So those four different customer segments, if you will. Each of those segments has what we call moments of truth that sit underneath them. And in those moments of truth, that customer, that employee, makes a decision about are they going to have a greater affinity for our brand or our company, or are they going to be driven into the arms of one of our competitors? And we know that 90% of millennials are either actively seeking or are open to a new job. Right now, today, in all of our organizations, and I was doing a new hire orientation yesterday, and I walked in the room, and a number of our new, new joiners are, are, uh, are millennials, and I thought to myself, we just gave you a job. We just hired you. And you're already thinking about your next job. And that's great because it's holding employers accountable for delivering an amazing employee experience to that internal customer. Um, and it asks us all to raise our game. So as I said earlier, we've got the right talent on the field in HR around the world. I really do believe that. I, I, I talk with and meet with colleagues and, and team members all around the world in conferences and, and roundtables and dinners. Um, we've got the right people. Now it's a matter of how are we as HR leaders um, organizing our functions and taking them to market, if you will, in a way that's responsive to this nature of the customer experience and response to the customer segments. So these moments of truth that sit underneath those customer experiences, I'll give you just a couple of examples. If everyone right now went out on your mobile phone and went to your company.com slash careers page and wanted to apply to a job in your company, how many clicks would that take? Mm. And could you do that standing in the queue at the airport ready, waiting to board a plane, right? That's a moment of truth for a candidate, for someone who's looking at our company as, do they want to come work for Velocity? Do they want to come be a Velocitor, we call them. And so we try and streamline that process whereby you know, our, our position descriptions are very clear. They are uh, devoid of um, exclusive language. We want to make sure that we have job postings that include everyone and are attractive to everyone who brings great skills to the table. Um, and is it easy to apply for a role in the company? So that's the first moment of truth. How hard is it to apply? Another moment of truth is how long um, am I in the process from, uh, from, uh, from apply to offer? So let's say that person does want to join Velocity and we want them to join the company. What's that timeline? And I'll tell you, Vishal, a couple of years ago, even inside Velocity, our timeline wasn't that great. Um, it was a lot longer than I think most top tier employees would tolerate. And I think when most people pick up their head in the marketplace and say, you know what, I think it's, I'm ready for a new role. I'm ready for my next job. I think they ha we have, we the employers, have somewhere between 30, maximum 45 days. Maximum. I would say it's probably closer to 30 days that we have to get someone into the interview process, get them all the way through, go through the compensation discussions, answer their benefits questions, and get them an offer. Because within a month, they will have made another buying decision. Because there are other great companies out there all around the world with whom we compete for talent, uh, many of whom with whom we partner uh, in the marketplace, but with whom we compete for talent, um, that they're going to be there ready to make those offers and to get them through the evaluation process. And it's got to be that two-way street. It's conversational in nature. Um, does it feel like I'm having a discussion 
with a prospective employer or back to a service provider, a vendor for my employee experience because I'm a customer coming with my expectations to this prospective employer about what that's going to look like. Um, and so that's one of the moments of truth. Another one I like to talk about is for managers. Um, last time that any of us who are people leaders on the call or, or in people service roles um, had to give someone constructive feedback. How hard is that? Um, do you go to HR and, you know, the old dusty binder that I talked about earlier, does it creak open to tab four? And it's like, well, you know, the following nine steps versus saying, you know what, I understand what you're trying to do in your business. I, I get the challenges that you're facing in the marketplace. And I understand where this person's underperformance is impacting your ability to deliver overall for the organization or for your customers. Mm -hmm. um, so we partnered with those managers, those leaders to, to really help manage underperformance, either up, over, or out, right? of the organization. That's a moment of truth for a manager, for that customer segment, the manager experience, where they say, you know what, I love working at this company. I'm doing the best work of my life here. I'm, I'm leading a great team who are engaged and who are doing the best work of their lives. And I feel like I'm able to bring my, my full effort to work every day, my authentic self, and all of my energy goes into delivering great products and services versus what I call feeding the machine, right? If I'm the HR person, and I, I'm a cost center, obviously, we're all cost centers, uh, in the HR function, um, you know, how much time does an employee or a manager have to spend sort of internally with this admin, you know, type function versus going out and talking to their customers or building or engineering great products or serving them? Um, that's what they came here to do. I mean, I think I'm a nice person, but they didn't come here to talk to me all day or talk to one of my team members. They want to go talk to customers. So, so that design thinking um, is really, I think, the start point uh, to really let great HR people do even better work. Interesting. Wow. Fascinating. So um, I was, um, I think just before our, our conversation, I was talking to one of the chief people officer for a, a 400 uh, people size company. And this guy was saying that he is in 14 countries um, and expanding rapidly as, and, and they are, they have workers from all, all around the world and there are some of them are remote workers. And now we're, we're living in this new reality. Like, so earlier, um, if you are in multinational or transnational company, you are maybe 10,000 size plus company or like you are uh, pretty much like an office driven company. Now almost every small size company is uh, making, uh, keeping the doors open for this remote worker and this new train. As a, as an HR leader, like, so how do you, and then you talked about providing that seamless experience to, to uh, employees so they can have an interaction with HR and they can um, grow with them and at least uh, be better represented with them. So as an HR leader, how do you, like what are some of the things that you are seeing uh, in, in, in the HR landscape where um, this, like how are HR is preparing to this new reality of remote workers and, and global global workforce? And, and what's your take on that? Yeah, I think the first part is, is being very intentional about what are we trying to, to drive. And this really involves um, HR truly having a seat at the table uh, on the executive staff uh, in the discussions about strategic planning for the company. So the, the, the strategic plan for the company really obviously gets informed by the customers or the stakeholders that then translates into what are the company's priorities at a given coming year, which then very quickly translates into what should be a workforce plan. The workforce plan in many companies, and in some companies where I've worked, and, and frankly, even sometimes when I've been a leader in those companies, the workforce plan blossoms like a wild garden. It's very interesting to look at, but wow, is it hard to tend, right? You don't know where the poppies are and where the carrots are, and is that a tomato over there, and what, what's mm -hmm. going on back here? Because it just sort of evolves and unfolds throughout the year. Uh, what that does, A, it gives leaders a lot of flexibility, and they can kind of shuck and jive all they want during the year, but what it does do also is it ends up in a very discordant employee experience because people don't know how their work fits into the overall organizational objectives. How, how is it that my work matters? Where do I matter when I come to work every day? When it's done in a very intentional and planful way, the workforce plan lays that out. It says, here's where we're going this year. Here's where this organization is going to be. Here's what they're going to deliver this year. Here's how they're going to grow and where they're going to grow to be able to deliver the value for our customers or stakeholders or shareholders um, out in the marketplace. Um, so very much intentional design uh, on the front end, and that requires HR to have a seat at the table. Or said more specifically, HR has to earn a seat at the table to be in that discussion. Once that workforce plan is kind of crafted, that's where we can start talking about, okay, what percentage of that is going to be sitting in your head office? 
What percent is going to be in a satellite office or a field office? And what percent of that is going to be remote, whether remote domestic or remote global, depending upon where your headquarters are? And that should be done in a thoughtful way, both with regard to A, where is, where is talent available, right? Where are the talent centers are trying to prosecute? And then B, what makes sense for your organization's cost structure um, in terms of are you trying to drive into lower labor cost markets um, or have more agility or flexibility for your team? Uh, there's one company out there with which I'm familiar, our, our, uh, our CFO is actually a board member, um, there where they don't have a single office. It's an entire virtual company. Like I think it's 500, 600 people, virtual company. They, they, they meet, and they have to meet, they, they meet in the hotel conference rooms or at you know, flexible working spaces. Um, that's an extreme example. I think most of us are in more of a hybrid example where we are leveraging um, individual contributors who are working remotely, sometimes leaders who are working remotely, um, and then some who are working in satellite offices and some in hub offices. So being intentional about that is the first part. On the HR front, I've seen two things that I think really work. Um, and the name of your podcast is Work 2.0. So I think in the Work 2.0 world, we've got to be thinking about what should we be doing differently. And I'll just share two ideas. Um, the first of which is uh, requiring every team member when you're working together, whether they're in the office or they're, or they're remote, to have their video on. Um, mm. And when I first required this, one of my team members came to me and she said, well, you know, I have to do my hair every day. What if I'm going to be on video? And I said, look at me. I don't even have hair. So don't worry about it. I don't really care what you look like on camera. I care that we're interacting as if we would were we sitting in an office together. Interesting. Seeing facial expressions, seeing uh, nonverbals. You know, you can tell if someone's paying attention by how they're nodding along in the conversation. Are they multitasking, et cetera? So requiring every team member to always be on video, I think, is really critical um, to create that. And, and when I do my team meetings, it actually looks like it's just like a collage of little boxes all around the world. Uh, my team in London, my team in Bangalore, my team in LA, you name it. Um, and we're all interacting in one meeting together. And it truly feels together versus on a conference call where, you know, mm -hmm. someone's multitasking, someone's letting the dog out, someone's doing laundry. You know, it's just, it doesn't work. You've got to be focused on the work and in the conversation or opt out of the meeting, right? Make sure that you're using your time and your colleagues' time wisely. So that's one. The second one um, is an idea that, that, that I heard the other day that I think is really fantastic and I'm starting to do it myself is this idea of virtual coffees. Mm. And so, Vishal, if you and I you know, were to work together you know, on a regular basis and, and I were a member of your team, you might say to me, David, um, the second Tuesday of every month at 11.30, your time, 3.30 my time, whatever it is, um, we're both going to go to our kitchen or our pantry, make a cup of tea, and we're gonna turn the video on. And wow. there is no agenda. There's no, there are no slides, there's no agenda, there's no talking points. It's just Vishal and David connecting as colleagues and having a cup of tea together and saying, how are you doing? What's new in your world? What are you excited about? What are you scared of? How's your family? Just truly having those interactions that we would quote unquote normally have in an office place, right? If you and I worked sitting side by side together every day, mm -hmm. I'd come and I'd say, Vishal, how was your night? You'd say, oh, the kids had soccer and I tried to make dinner, but I burned the bread and you know, whatever. You know, it's just those little tiny like micro interactions that connect humans together because at the end of the day, we're in human resources and we got to keep the human in human resources and we're people first, we're workers second. Um, and so uh, having those, structuring those in a way that engages a geographic neutral workforce um, that gives authentic human interactions, I think is really important. And you've got to take really dramatic steps to do that, which is really block your calendar out to have coffee with someone um, virtually and not have an agenda. Um, so those are just two ideas that I've seen uh, work well and that I really try and espouse. Um, to, to drive this forward to make sure that we're engaging the entire workforce, whether they're sitting in their home in a remote location somewhere in the world or they're sitting in a downtown office building like I am. We'll be back after a short break. This part of the podcast is sponsored by Taudot AI, world's first AI-powered platform to build enterprise success network. Learn more at Taudot AI. Let's go back. No, I think definitely uh, virtual coffee, I, uh, I would try that. It's 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 a, it's a genius idea. I think it's a and Good. thank you for yeah, doing that. So um, other thing, it, I, I think um, last week I was talking to one CEO friend of mine, CEO of a small size um, startup, and uh, and he is very focused. I think uh, it was a very interesting conversation. So he said, Vishal, I want to build a culture which which actually help my company grow, go like do some fun stuff. And he's expanding. I think right now it's, it's about three, four hundred. It's not a start startup now. He's more of more of a mid scale. And he said that he he was in a ruffle with their HR 
because it, he is not he said i want people to be traveling like living here in mm-hmm. this area so mm-hmm. i can i can work with them and mm-hmm. now the hr is saying hey this is not trendy like the trendy now is this globalization and people are like why you are restricting yourself from getting work from all mm-hmm. over the world mm-hmm. when you can get them at an at an affordable cost and all that so if you are in hr who is in this this sort of uh, uh, tug of war between the legacy way of doing business where okay i want this things here and and the, on on the other side where you see the trends are pointing towards something else mm-hmm. what would be what would be your suggestions or or two cents for those hr leaders mm-hmm. who are in this fix of convincing leadership on on what to do yeah i uh, it's an interesting question i faced that myself with my clients and to be fair full disclosure vishal transparency is a key value um i face that some of myself that i think to myself oh it'd be so much easier if that person just sat here and i find myself almost slipping into that um so if you gave me a choice and you said look you can hire your entire employee success team in downtown san francisco they'll sit right here in the tower with you would you do that i would say absolutely now i would not get the the most amazing talent in the world that i have on the team which i'm super grateful for um and i would lose that diversity um geographic diversity intellectual diversity emotional diversity, experience diversity, you name it, I'd lose all that richness because I centered myself just in one part of the country, one part of the world. Um, so I, I'm, I, but I do fall prey to it myself, I have to admit that. Mm. And I do have clients who say, you know, I really want to hire in a headquarters location or in a, in a, in a key location. Um, so anybody who's been in a sales role who's listening to your, your podcast right now, um, when a customer says to us, um, I like your product, but it's too expensive. Our answer to that is always compared to what, mm. right? So if you're comparing my product to other product, we go and we shift the discussion to value. We shift it mm. off of price to value. We talk about what our product or service is going to do for you that is meeting a pain point in your business mm. versus going back to my price point is wrong, right? This is a very, mm. very pedestrian sort of conversation to be involved with a customer. If you're having a price conversation, you're probably not having the right conversation. Mm. So too do I think this discussion with leaders about where my people sit. And so I, I offer that customer example to say the response that I try and offer and the one to myself, quite frankly, is what else is going on in there that you're saying, I need that person here? And is it a question of, am I not sure that that individual in the past that I've had in this role was fully focused? Were they not fully engaged? Were they not accessible to me? And really unpacking a bit of that with the leader to say, it sounds like you want someone who's going to be really responsive when you have on the fly questions. Mm. And the leader's probably going to go, yeah, I just want to walk over to their desk and say, what's going on with X? Well, we all sit at desks somewhere in the world. What if we had an SLA, a service level agreement inside of our team that from the core hours of X to Y in the day, you know, your response time to a chat message is within five minutes. And your email responses, responsiveness is within one hour. What if we just set those SLAs up for our teams and articulated that? I had a, a leader once I worked with, he actually had a user guide for himself, just like you would have a user guide for a, a device that you bought, right? Wow. Television or something. And it actually walked through things about himself, things about me. Here's what you need to know about me. Here's how I work, when I work, how I operate, my expectations, both articulated and frankly, some of the unarticulated ones that I have that I may never tell you about, but I probably still want from you or are part of the norms of our team or the way I like to work. This extreme to create this user guide for himself. So those are really fun. I don't know if I'd want to do that. It might scare me if I made a user guide for myself. Um, but the idea being, let's articulate those expectations. Let's get those out there. If you want responsiveness within five minutes to a, to a, uh, a Google Hangout or a Slack message, then say that. And, and ask people if they can commit to that. And if they can, then they're probably right for your team. If they're unable to, or they like working a different way, that may not be a fit. And in doing that, we sort of unpack the what's underneath that whole, they have to sit co-located with me, you know, five days a week, you know, 10 hours a day. There's probably something else going on there that's worth the conversation that goes back to this idea of HR as a trusted advisor and a key partner versus the necessary evil of, I want six hires in this location, go get them. Right, so it's sort of an order of fulfillment, which we still do. Don't get me wrong; that's still part of our our core job is to you know, talent acquisition. That's a critical piece of our function. Um, but that partnership with the leaders to talk about: tell me about how you work. What are the team norms you want to have? What does your team success look like when it's operating fully? 
And you can probably unpack those into ways that you can find functions uh, inside the business operation that can can meet those needs. Interesting. And then one one area I'm really curious to learn from you um, as an HR leader. So <clears throat> we talk to various leaders at various levels and we are seeing, and I'm coming from the data and technology end, right? So uh, what we see is technology is integral part of almost every uh, business process, including HR. And when technology right now, it's at, at, at a very interesting stage. So where technology is getting disrupted in mm-hmm. a very interesting way. That means even the business that's that's running on those technologies are also getting disrupted, right? Mm-hmm. So whether you call it uh, organizational structure are getting dis- uh, disrupted, um, employee expectations are being disrupted, like worker, office space, everything, like every aspect of HR is getting disrupted. So <clears throat> when you're running an organization, uh, when almost every uh, aspect of the business is somewhat shaky in a way that they're maturing, they're, mm-hmm. they're transforming. How do you keep yourself um, at peace, at balance to mm-hmm. understand like how to, how do you grow your company through this disruptive time? Like what, what are some of the, some of the hacks or tricks you could share that mm-hmm. is helping you sort of stay sane throughout this, this evolution? Yeah, I think the first one, it's an analogy that I was down in Mexico on a, a vacation this couple of years ago, and I had never surfed before. And anyone on your, who's listening to your podcast who surfed will probably resonate with this, but you can kind of envision it in your mind even if you haven't. The instructor said to me, when you think about what you're doing out there surfing, he said, you either ride the wave or the wave rides you. Mm. And he said, so if when you're trying to get up on the wave and you're fighting it, it's going to smack you in the face, it's going to push you under the water, and it's going to turn you upside down. He said, but if you focus on working with the way the wave moves and getting on top of it, you're going to be much more likely, A, to enjoy yourself, uh, and B, not get dunked under the water and rolled around, which I think in today's day and age, um, many of us probably feel that way with the rate of change in organizations, is it feels like you're getting dunked under water and rolled over and dragged through the sand, versus thinking about how do I know that the uncertainty is going to happen? This is sort of the new normal in business, in our industries, in our organizations, and how do I move along with that? So the idea that all of our engineering organizations have gone to agile methodology, right? We don't do really waterfall development, most companies anymore. We're all in an agile world. Um, How do we think also about running and guiding and serving our HR teams in an agile way? Are we using sprints in the same way that our developers using sprints? And do we have them in really tight timeframes with very achievable deliverables that allow us to pivot and shift as the product grows and matures? And are we doing multiple releases per year? Right back in the day, uh, HR used to have kind of a big bang. It was like once a year we rolled out all of our new stuff, and we had all of our little PDFs and our enablement sessions, and, and then everyone, okay, good, we've got it. That's not how people think about their business anymore. That's not the way that people think about their work or their lives anymore. We are in this agile environment, and so the idea of iterating uh, is very, very important, and being comfortable with that. Things are going to shift. I'll give you a practical example of that. Um, I no longer allow any policies to be created in anything but a Google Doc. Mm. So uh, our handbook is a great example. Um, uh, It sits on a Google Doc, and everyone's able to access it, and you're always on the latest version. You're never down rev on the employee handbook. That's a pedantic example, but at the same time, if someone needs to know what's our policy on X, they want to know they're going to the right version versus, and I'm sure every HR person who's listening to this podcast has heard, you know, the person pulls up some dusty old copy of a policy from 10 years back, It says, well, it says here, and they go, oh, it's the wrong version. Come on. Um, So how do you shift the way you're using technology um, to enable that, to operate in this agile environment? And then when I make a change or my team makes a change to the handbook, we have a little change log at the bottom that captures what the change was. What section, what changed, what day was it changed on? And so they can track it and say, oh, I thought it used to be that. Oh, let me look at the change log. Okay, it changed. I've been updated, and I'm aware of that. I also don't have to send out new versions of the handbook all the time to let people know, you know, what the organization is using in terms of our policies. That's just a small example of, again, a very pedestrian example of how do we use technology to not only keep pace of the business, but help set the pace of the business. And when the business looks at HR and says, wow, you all are able to pivot and move with us with the agility that we need, and it matches and mirrors the agile approach that we use and how we run our parts of the business, especially engineering in that example, um, that gets us a seat at the table. That gets us a place uh, of airtime, you know, in the meeting to, to put forth our ideas. Um, so back to that analogy of you either ride the wave or the wave rides you. 
Mm. The wave is out there. The wave is big. The wave is moving fast. We've got to learn to surf. Um, and the way we learn to surf is by being responsive to the trends that we're seeing uh, and really partnering with the business. Interesting. And and um, what's your take on the technology and AI in HR? Like what what what's your take on uh, how technology is um, is transforming HR? Like what mm -hmm. um, like what are some of the trends that you are seeing and, and you're bullish about that uh, how AI is being used in HR nowadays? We'll be back after a short break. This part of the podcast is sponsored by Tauded AI, world's first AI-powered platform to build enterprise success network. Learn more at Tauded AI. Let's go back. Yeah, um, you know, there's there's sort of the dark side of AI where people think, oh, all of our jobs are going to be replaced, and you know, we're going to all be out of work. Um, there's another side of of AI that um, I think transforms us into superhumans or super servers super servants of other people mm. and they give AI can give us insights into how to be of greater service. I'll give you an example. Um, and in the last couple of years, some of the data that I've been working with inside of our organizations is around looking at what are the first five questions that a new employee asks of the company. Um, and over time I've got a data set that kind of tells me what those are. And for example, back to the earlier part of the conversation with the manager, one of the first questions they ask me, usually within the first three months in the company, is how do I put someone into performance management, right? When you come as a new leader, you assess your team, you kind of look at what you've got, you probably have 80% of your people are just rocking and rolling, uh, and 20% of them maybe need a little bit of help, they need a little encouragement, they need correction, or maybe they're not right for the team or the organization anymore. The manager wants to know, how do I go about doing that? Mm -hmm. So using some of the data from that, um, I'm able actually to proactively push content out to those customer segments before they even know they need it. And I can set that up in a way that can track someone's um, work inside the organization. So if I see them looking at certain articles uh, inside of our infrastructure, and of course this is all disclosed and very transparent, um, uh, or I know that they fit in a certain customer segment, I'm gonna put them on an automatic journey that's gonna push them content that they're gonna need um, even before they know they need it. And I'm gonna use click-through rates, and I'm gonna use page dwell times, to look at, well, does that, is that interesting to them? Do they care about it? Did they click on it? Are they reading it? Are they taking a next action on it? So the same thing that marketers use for us as customers out in the world when they send us an email, so too do I try and leverage internally in a non-invasive, non-creepy, overt, transparent way to say, the way we're structuring this is here to serve you better. Um, because again, I wanna kind of stay out of your way most of the time. You're, you're trying to run the engineering team, right? You're building a great product. You don't want to talk to me every day. You do want to know that I'm there when you need me. And frankly, you want me there even when you don't know that I am needed, right? You just want me to kind of pop up and say, hey, I noticed that you're trying to do this. You remember that old um, the little uh, paper clip in Microsoft Word yeah. clippy? Kind of annoying, right? It was like, it looks like you're writing a letter. Bink, bink, bink. Um, sometimes you were writing a letter and you're like, oh, actually, great. There's a template for that. What if we can replicate some of that in a similar way? Mm -hmm. um, but really have a 100% hit rate or 99% to say, you know what, that's right. The customer or the employee in this case was trying to do that or they want to do this or they had a question about that and I just pop up my team or my data or my content just pops up and serves them in a proactive way. That's really where I think the, the kind of the high sweet fruit of AI sits right now for us mm -hmm. in terms of how do we serve our customers, our employees, our managers, our new hires, our candidates in ways that they don't even know they want, but they are delighted when we do it. That they go, wow, I, I didn't even know that was possible. Thank you. Um, that's, that's the highest compliment that I can, I can get for our team's work is when one of our customers says, I didn't even know you could do that. It's like, yeah, not only did you do that, but we did do that, and it served you in a way that delighted you. Interesting. I think that's, that's, that's fascinating. So um, one... Um, so one aspect I want to understand from you is that um, bias, right? So when I think I'm always curious to learn with great power comes great responsibility, right? And, and leaders are, are basically, they, are, they have this um, so-called responsibility and bias is a big problem at leadership levels, right? So they, they come with their own baggage. They many oftentimes uh, uh, get into this tailwind of uh, just, huddling through their own own baggages. 
like what what is some of the hacks that you had that you have used to check yourself from any of the biases that you bring to the table mm -hmm. yeah one of them uh is is just consciousness raising and uh i've, I've come from an enterprise software world where mm -hmm. traditionally uh, the people who've led enterprise software companies for the last, you know, 30 years have largely been men and largely mm -hmm. been men that sort of look frankly like me. Mm -hmm. And uh, so one of the things that I, I actually pulled a leader aside um, a couple weeks ago, he was putting a strategy together and he was saying, we're going to do an offsite and in the morning we're all going to go work out together. Mm -hmm. And I was like, okay, fair enough. Many people of all backgrounds and shapes and sizes exercise. I get that. Mm -hmm. The idea of going out, and it was a, a, a person who was going to lead the exercise. It was going to be like a you know, kind of very fit person who was going to do this. Mm. And I said to him, how might that potentially put some people off, right? Mm. What if they don't exercise or they can't or they're concerned about their own physical capabilities? Mm. Um, so what if instead, I know you want to get outside and get some fresh air and be in San Francisco. I said, what if we did a beach cleanup, mm. right? What if we went down to the same people you wanted to work out on and we all put our exercise gear on. So get your shorts and your trainers and, you know, your T-shirts on. Um, and let's go out and, and actually pick up, you know, garbage and clean up the beach and do something of service while still being together, having a collective experience that is physical in nature, but that allows people to operate and participate at their own physical capability level. So if someone wants to say, I'm going to try and pick up a hundred pieces of garbage because I can bend down a lot of times and, and walk really quickly with a couple other people, that's great. Or if some people want to take it a little bit more slowly, that's okay too, but we're having a collective experience. So I think that's the first one is just consciousness raising. Mm. Uh, not everyone has the same journey at the same time. It doesn't mean that we all have to do the same thing. It's okay that we're different. It's okay that we have individual richness about our backgrounds and our experiences and, and who we are as people. And there is a place for all of us. I think about it like a, a patchwork quilt. Um, mm. And there are these amazing, colorful, beautiful threads that run through our companies and our organizations that together create this tapestry. Um, that keeps us warm and keeps us comfortable or hangs on our wall and, and looks great um, or uh, comforts our family. That's us. That's our company. That's the fabric of our organization. And each of us brings this diverse thread to the table that makes us strong and interesting. I was talking with a leader a couple of years ago, and uh, he was saying, you know, I like diversity. And I was thinking he was going to say something like, oh, it's good for PR or something like that. And he said, it's just more fun. He said, it's more fun to come to work. Um, mm -hmm company that has people that look and think and do differently than I do. Uh, and I thought that was a really interesting concept. He said, let's, let's stay away from all of the, the trappings of the DNI language that we sometimes get really wrapped around the axle on. And I know they're well intending. They said, let's get back to just the nature of what is it to be human and have a human experience. And human experiences are richer when they're more diverse. Full stop. So let's go build a diverse company, which I thought was a really interesting sort of way to cut through all the discussion and get to brass tacks about why it's it's a good thing to have diverse and inclusive organizations because it's more fun to be in them. And oh, by the way, I think organizations have an obligation to the world to give people meaningful work to do where they feel psychologically safe. They are challenged. They're given goals that are meaningful and reasonable and they're given feedback and coaching and they can grow. Um, and that requires a, a diverse uh, mindset, intellectual diversity or psychological diversity about how we think about how people uh, come to the table. Um, so that's on, on one side of it. On a practical, tactical side, you asked about hacks. Um, one of the things that you hear at Velocity is we require all of our recruiters before they go to offer with a candidate to have presented at least one candidate from a non-traditional or underrepresented background. Mm. Now, that could mean someone who comes from a different um, ethnic or racial background than mm. the majority of the people in that particular work group, or it could be someone who is making a career transition. Think about a working parent, maybe, who's been out of the workforce for you know three, yeah. five 15 years, but it's coming back into the workforce. That would be a non-traditional candidate. So I'm not putting a marker out there that says you have to have so many people that look like this that you have to interview or hire. Um, I am saying you've got to keep your aperture open, and I'm going to force your aperture open just a little bit to make sure your lens is wide, looking at non-traditional talent pools. Um, and you've got to do that before I'll let an offer go out the door. You have to bring me one credible candidate whom you've screened, non-traditional, underrepresented background. What that does is then, and we've even seen this already, this is about six months we've had this in place, that the recruiters are then taking those candidates to their hiring managers. The hiring manager is going, wow, you know, I never thought about that. That's someone who, for example, was in uh, maybe management consulting for 10 years, left to, to have a family, and he or she or they came back to the workforce. 
and they are amazing fit for our professional services organization, right? They might think, oh, I can only go back into consulting, but actually, you know, we do consultative work with our clients every day, probably very similar skill set. Um, and maybe you've taken some training or some classes offline and you've learned to use velocity. All of our training is free um, out on the internet, certified on velocity for free. And if they've taken that step, wow, we have a place for them where they can come in and do amazing work and drive their career forward. So that's kind of one of the minor hacks. It doesn't cost anything. It's not me setting quotas or, you know, putting big banners out on the internet about it. It's just the way we operate, you know, in a, in a very right. meaningful, planful, thoughtful, and frankly, quiet way of just here's how we do our work. Um, and, uh, and that idea, frankly, was brought to me by one of our recruiting team who said, how can we do this in a way that doesn't require us to set quotas, which just feel kind of not right, um, but in a way that is authentic and can help move the needle. And, and Vishal, we're seeing movement, and that's great. And that's what we're all, awesome. all of us in the HR function, um, that, is, that is placed on us as a great responsibility, as you said, with, with great power, authority, or whatever we've got. Um, it comes that responsibility to help our organizations drive forward from a DNI perspective to create these safe and inclusive, uh, wide, wide ranging, um, you know, experiences that we, we take to market. Interesting. And, and if, if we talk about say future of work, right. And, 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 um, and jobs of future mm -hmm. as an HR leader, like what do you think would be next for next five year, 10 year? Mm -hmm. What are some of the bigger, bigger challenges that HR leaders would face that we should, one should, uh, start prepping for as an HR leader? Yeah, it's a, it's a big word that I don't often use because I'm not sure I fully understand it, but neuroplasticity, I think, is the number one thing um, that we can help uh, create organizations that are learning organizations where people are hired into them and knowing when they come in the door, you're probably not going to be in the same job that I'm hiring you for um, in five years from now or in three years from now or, frankly, in companies like ours with this stratospheric rate of growth, even a year from now. We're going to ask you to take on something else, or you're going to raise your hand and say, I'd like a new challenge. And how do we set up the, the uh, candidate evaluation, both for the candidates of our company and us of the candidates, to make sure that we're hiring people who are really focused on that um, learning mindset, on that neuroplastic, the, the researchers call it. Um, and is my brain malleable to the point where I can learn something new? And do I have an underlying um, sort of uh, modus operandi of how I think about my work that is taking on new challenges. It is, it is, it is pushing myself. And if I'm not being pushed, I'm going to ask to be pushed. Those are the kind of people that we want to hire here at Velocity, whom we are hiring. And frankly, I think the ones uh, out in the talent market who are going to be successful over time are the ones who come in and say, I, I know I'm not going to do the same job next year at the time I am now. That goes back to this idea of what is the millennial expectation the gig economy is beyond, you know, our, our DoorDash delivery people and our, our Deliveroo drivers and our Uber Lyft drivers. It's all of us. All of us are thinking about ourselves as these amazing contributors mm. who are going to contribute to many different organizations over our career and will bring a very rich point of view from our diverse backgrounds to deliver value. Um, our HR teams have got to be in the position where we say, not only is that's okay if that's what you want, because that's frankly what the, the worker of today and tomorrow want, but we want you to be that way. And we're going to encourage you and we're going to give you those options. I'll give you a small example. One of the organizations I worked in, um, every three months, uh, they had a release of the software. And after every release, um, there was something called Opportunity Open Market. Mm -hmm. And that meant that every engineer in the company could take a different job in the organization on a different team. And no leader could hold the team back, right? Mm -hmm. It was like it was just—it was almost like a science fair. If you remember those in, in school here in the United States, maybe where you set up your little table and the team says, "Here's what we're doing in our next sprint. Um, this is going to be amazing. Here's where we need contributors. Here's where we need skills. If you don't know Python yet, you can come here and we'll teach you, and then you'll be able to deliver within you know four or six weeks, etc." Um, and so that idea of how are we structuring organizations that not only allow for but that career agility. I had a colleague of mine, he described it as um, the career scaffolding um, versus the career ladder, right? The traditional kind of thing is like, okay, I'm on this wrong, I'm on this wrong, I'm on this wrong. That's not the way the world works anymore. It's a, it's a scaffolding. Or another colleague of mine, she called it the career jungle gym. So think about that when you're on the playground as a kid, um, swinging from, 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 from place to place on the, on the gym and testing yourself and, and growing in new ways and, and go up and you go down and you go sideways. That's the reality of work today. Um, about how uh, how our, how we think about work and how organizations need us to work, um, because the pace of the market is changing so fast, 
right? Our customer demands are increasing, they're accelerating, they're getting more and more dynamic over time. We've got to have organizations that can pivot with equal agility. And back to the earlier part of our conversation, Vishal, we've got to lead and run HR organizations that not only allow for that, but encourage and enable that in our workforces. Interesting. Wow. No, I think that's that's fascinating. And um, I think it, it, it's always fun to talk to someone who is actually very uh, progressive in thinking, I think. And thank you so much for sharing your, your point of views. It's it's really, really refreshing to, because even in, 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 in our profession, we talk to, as I, as I was talking to you before our conversation, we talk to every kind of HR professional. So it, yeah. it's, it's definitely always fun to have someone which is very refreshing and and very progressive looking and it, it basically elevate the entire industry. So I do appreciate you on oh, that. My pleasure. So um, it brings us to the end of the conversation and uh, I want to spend a few minutes on your personal journey sure. to um, to see what's going on and, and, and basically help our uh, listeners and viewers understand what it takes to build up a good leader. So if we say um, in your journey, what are some of the attributes that has really helped you become what you are? or mm -hmm. that has really contributed to help you what you are today. What would mm -hmm. what would those qualities be? Like what would you attribute your success to? Yeah, the first is, uh, I've got to tell you, I don't think I'm successful. I don't think I've got it all figured out. I really don't. I think I'm, I'm doing the best I can. Uh, every day I get up and try and focus on serving our customers internally, um, and that's what I'm focused on. I said once to a colleague of mine, I said, if you ever work for a leader who says, um, I got this, I got this. You should immediately turn and run out of that room and then call me and I will help you get a job somewhere else. Because no leader, um, certainly this one on this side of the call, has it all figured out. None of us. Mm -hmm. do. I think we're constantly learning. We're constantly growing. We're constantly challenging the heuristics we've used to manage our worlds in the past because the world is changing. So I think that's the first one is just be, have a mindset of you're never done learning. You're never done growing. And you definitely, especially in HR, ever, we never have it all figured out ever. Um, because we got to keep we got to keep moving with the business and with the market. Um, the second one, and and I'm 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 honored for this is I've entered a new phase of my life um, that I have a, a new son. He's uh, he's about six months old. And congratulations! Um, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, and he has more hair than I do, so I'm already jealous of the kid. <laughs> um, but he's got a great smile, and and uh, and my wife Erin is, is an amazing mom. What it's done for me is given me a chance to sort of reset. What is it that makes my life rich? And it doesn't necessarily have to be a new child or a spouse or a partner. It can be anything. It can be a hobby. It can be um, you know, a, a special person in your life. It can be a, an idea that you're thinking about. It can be an invention you're pursuing. Anything that, that gives you passion um, in life. And whether that passion is inside of your work world or outside of it, it's acknowledging that, that I am a human who's been put on this earth by whatever force you believe in, whether it's the you know entropy or happenstance or some you know beneficent being out there, um, we're all here for some reason or set of reasons, um, and we're here to contribute. We're here to make a difference. And at the end of the day, our job is to make a difference in the lives of others. Whether we're building software, servicing software, running HR, leading a company, being an entrepreneur, you name it, our job is to be of service. Um, and so, staying focused on that um, of what am I here for? What makes my life rich? And where do I find my center is very, very important. So, so I've had a chance to revisit that as a, as a, as a person, let alone a professional, of revisiting my center um, and focusing on what is it that makes my life rich and what is my life's calling and recommitting to that. I think we've got to do that every, at least every year, every five years maybe um, in, our, in our professional lives of what am I here for, what am I doing, and uh, how does my life matter to the world? Um, so when, mm. I, when, I'm, when I'm gone and I'm no longer here in my physical form, um, is there something I've done that endures in the world that has driven positive change? And I think that's why, frankly, most everyone who's listening and watching your podcast is in this business, right? We're in HR to be of service, hopefully. Um, the, the word human is in there, so hopefully we're, we're good with working with people. <laughs> um, so revisiting that, I think, is really important uh, on top of knowing that we're never fully done learning and growing. Interesting. And um, last but not least, so if you want something... Uh, for our listeners and viewers, if, if you want our listeners and viewers to take away something from this conversation, like what would that be? What would be your closing remark? In this role of service, I think, to, to people and to organizations, one of the most powerful things we can do is ask. Hmm. Ask for feedback. Um, and to say, how is this going for you? 
right? Here's my intention. Here's what I'm trying to deliver for you. How's that working for you? Um, and get that feedback and truly, truly be open to it. Sometimes it's hard, right? They say feedback is a gift. Sometimes it's a gift you want to return or take back to the store, but there's no receipt for it. You can't take it back. It's coming at you and, and it's, there's value in it. And when someone gives us feedback, it's because they care. It's because they want um, us to deliver value. And then we thank them for that and express mm-hmm. gratitude. And that's probably the most important thing to leave with um, on this podcast is about gratitude, saying thank you, um, expressing appreciation for what someone else is doing for you or the opportunity that you have to serve them, uh, then regrounds us in this life of service. Interesting. With that, uh, David, thank you so much uh, once again for spending a good amount of time with us, like helping us understand the HR leadership and, and basically what a progressive leader looks like. And I, I do appreciate you and wish you nothing but success in your journey. You're always welcome back on the podcast to to uh, share updates on how things are growing and hopefully you'll have um, more uh, things to say. Is, is, is he your first son or? Yeah, yeah, Jack is our first, yeah. Oh, nice. So, so you would, a um, lot of action awaiting there as yes, well. Yes, so sleep, sleep was nice <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Vishal, thank you for everything you're doing for our industry. I really appreciate it. And thanks for the opportunity to share. Yeah, yeah, I just, I just, uh, I just, I was sick of home, but actually I was homesick. Never really knew that I would have to grow up so quick. I'm so uncomfortable, don't know anybody here. Just a couple dudes that I met once, that's it. And I go into the booth feeling nervous. Got butterflies in my stomach like I'm so worthless. Is the mic gone? I don't know how to work this. Inside I'm breaking down, I hope I'm not up on the side.